Hello everyone in Cardiomyes channel and welcome to another video in the guidelines of effective endocarditis as we are going to speak today about two specific types of endocarditis which are right-sided infective endocarditis and the non-bacterial which is non-infectious thrombotic endocarditis. First of all let's remind ourselves with the modified Dukes criteria which were validated by the 2023 task force. Major criteria include blood cultures positive for infective endocarditis, either typical organism in two separate blood cultures, or microorganism consistent with infective endocarditis from continuously positive blood cultures with these conditions, single positive blood culture or elevated IgG for coxiella pernitae or imaging evidence for infective endocarditis like valvular, perivalvular, periprostatic or foreign material anatomic or metabolic lesion either by the echo, cardiac CT, PET scan or SPECT CT. And the minor criteria includes predisposing condition, fever defined as temperature more than 38 degrees, embolic vascular dissemination even if they are asymptomatic, immunological phenomena or microbiological evidence not fulfilling the criteria for being major. And we consider infective endocarditis to be definite if there are two major criteria, one major criterion and at least three minor criteria or five minor criteria, possible if there is just one major with one or two minor criteria or three to four minor criteria and rejected if it doesn't meet the criteria for definite or possible infective endocarditis at admission with or without an alternative diagnosis. Let's start with the right-sided infective endocarditis. It's not uncommon in our clinical practice to see it as it represents 5 to 10% of the whole patients with infective endocarditis, but its frequency may be increasing nowadays due to increasing risk factors. The most common are in people who inject drugs as they are liable to introduce skin flora or other infection into the bloodstream affecting the tricuspid valve at first. Patients who congenital heart disease as they are having dilated right side or pulmonary hypertension, patients with indwelling venous catheters like central line or Mahuker for hemodialysis, they are the worst prognosis group of course due to persistent infection. Patients with cardiac implantable electronic device including pacemakers, CRT or ICDs and we are going to speak about them in a separate video and immunocompromised patients like for example patients who receive chemotherapy or patients who are having hematological disease. Of course the most common microorganism causing right-sided infective endocarditis is a staph aureus and coagulase negative staph. Tricuspid valve is much more commonly affected than the pulmonary valve and rarely the right side is spread to the left side structure but to have a spread from the left to the right is not uncommon. So whenever you see affection of both left and right sides you suspect that it started in the left side structure and then it spread to the right sides. And perivalvular abscess or perivalvular invasion into the surrounding structure is rarely seen in right-sided heart failure, unlike the left-sided, unless the right-sided infection was a secondary consequence of left-sided infective endocarditis. So it is not common here to see perivalvular abscess, dehiscence, or pseudoaneurysm due to lower risk of perivalvular invasion. Then how to diagnose it? Of course, the patient mostly presents with fever due to bactremia, plus or minus pulmonary complaints due to septic pulmonary emboli, which is the first organ to receive embolism from the vegetation on the tricuspid valve, like having dry or productive cough, pruritic chest pain, or hemopsis. And some patients may develop right-sided heart failure due to tricuspid or pulmonary valve regurgitation or sometimes due to pulmonary hypertension induced by the multiple pulmonary septic emboli so the patient present with abdominal swelling due to congested liver and bilateral lower limb edema. Transrostic echo is the first investigation to ask for as it allows adequate evaluation of the tricuspid valve due to the anterior location of this valve. So here I don't need transovagial for the tricuspid but I need transovagial to evaluate pulmonary valve as it is less adequately evaluated by the transrostic echo or patients with indwelling venous catheter or intracardiac device. So we are going to need post-transrostic and transesophageal. 
and in some cases vegetation may be difficult to identify especially on the pulmonary valve and especially if it is a prosthetic pulmonary valve so we are going to ask for PET scan to identify abnormal uptake of fluorodeoxyglucose and don't forget to ask for CT chest to identify concomitant pulmonary disease mostly due to septic pulmonary emboli like infarcts or abscess formation or even pleural effusion and embyema and some patients may develop lung abscess due to the septic pulmonary emboli some doctors are pessimistic when they see a patient with right-sided infective endocarditis however it has a more benign prognosis in comparison to the left-sided infective endocarditis as less incidence of perivalvular spread and it can be medically managed in 90 percent of patients just antibiotic treatment is enough to resolve the infection and surgery only in case of failure of medical treatment some exceptions are patients with pacemaker as you have a worse prognosis than those without electronic device and you are going to speak about this in a specific video and in immunocompromised patients they are liable for fungal infection in this case it poorly respond to the antibiotics and antifungals and mostly it will need surgery how are going to treat right-sided infective endocarditis antibiotic therapy is a cornerstone we start empirical antibiotic therapy after withdrawing three blood cultures and the choice for antibiotics depends on the suspected microorganism the type of drug and solvent that this person is injecting in his veins and the site of the infection staph aureus should be covered in all cases as it is the most common microorganism so the initial treatment which is empirical consists of penicillinase resistant penicillin vancomycin or daptomycin depending on the local prevalence of MRSA in this hospital and gentamicin for maximum two weeks and then you modify the treatment according to the results of the blood culture what about the duration in some patients we may use two week treatment with oxacillin or cloxacillin which act on the penicillinase producing bacteria without gentamicin or vancomycin this is effective in some patient for example mesicillin sensitive staph aureus is a causative organism so it is not MRSA good clinical and microbiological response to treatment after four days of antibiotics vegetation size less than 20 millimeter absence of metastatic signs of infection in the lung or empyema psoriasis absence of any cardiac or extra cardiac complication absence of prosthetic valve absence of left-sided valve infection and absence of severe immunosuppression so this patient is immunocompetent if all these conditions are fulfilled in the patient so we can use just two weeks of treatment without vancomycin or gentamicin otherwise if these conditions are not fulfilled so we should have four to six week treatment in all the remaining patients and using other antibiotics including penicillinase resistant penicillin plus vancomycin or daptomycin plus gentamicin for maximum two weeks because this patient is complicated or immunocompromised or having very large vegetation so we are going to need combined antibiotics for a longer duration what about the people who inject drugs it's a treatment different if this patient is a pentazosin addict which is a recreational drug it may introduce infection with gram negative bacteria so in this case i want to add anti pseudomonal agents like specific types of cephalosporin or quinolones and if the patient is having very large vegetation with history of brown heroin use which is usually dissolved in lemon juice this suggests infection by candida fungus so i want to use anti fungal agent for this patient per se so the may be necessary the antifungals in people who inject drugs especially if they are immunocompromised with very large vegetations in treatment of fungal endocarditis the choice of antifungals depends on the suspected fungal infection so if we are dealing for example with candidal infective endocarditis like in people who inject drugs we choose usually echinocandine or liposomal amphotericin B plus minus flocytosine but if you are dealing with aspergillus which is common in immunocompromised patients like those who receive chemotherapy so we are going to choose voriconazole plus minus echinocandine or amphotericin B some patients may need suppressive 
long-term treatment with oral azoles like fluconazole or voriconazole due to the persistence of infection. So this should be the decision of the endocarditis team. And of course, the choice of antifungals, it should be alizone with the clinical pharmacist to choose the suitable antifungals and the appropriate dose according to the type of patient, comorbidities and the local policy of the hospital. Some people who inject drugs may have no IV access at all due to recurrent thrombophlebitis from drug injection. So we may have oral antibiotics like ciprofloxacin 750 mg twice per day plus rifampicin 300 mg twice per day provided that the strain is susceptible to post drugs patient is uncomplicated with monitoring of the patient adherence or compliance. In this case, I can prescribe oral treatment. And if the patient is improving, I can continue outpatient treatment as we mentioned in the video of treatment of infective endocarditis. But in few cases, surgery is recommended in those with right-sided infective endocarditis who are receiving appropriate antibiotics for the following reasons. Number one, presence of RV dysfunction secondary to acute severe TR not responding to diuretics. So we are speaking about refractory heart failure. This is a class one indication for surgery. Persistent vegetation resulting in multiple pulmonary emboli causing respiratory insufficiency requiring ventilatory support, a class one indication. Large tricuspid vegetation more than 20 millimeter after recurrent septic emboli so i know that this very large vegetation is a source of multiple emboli and patient with simultaneous involvement of left heart structure of course this is a class one indication also for surgery for both the valves affected the fifth indication is a class 2a in patients with right-sided infective endocarditis receiving appropriate antibiotics with persistent bactremia after at least one week of appropriate antibiotic Therapy. But remember that isolated tricuspid vegetation is not an indication for surgery. It was class 2B in left-sided infective endocarditis with some debate regarding the benefits of early surgery versus conservative treatment, but in right-sided gives the patient a chance for adequate antibiotic therapy. If we decided that the patient is indicated for surgery, tricuspid valve repair should be considered instead of replacement if possible and the tricuspid valve is not completely damaged because repair may be associated with better short and long-term outcomes than replacement, especially regarding the risk of recurrent infection and need for redo surgery, which is much lower with tricuspid valve repair. But if we decided to have a replacement, then bioprosthetics are preferred due to concern with the risk of lifelong anticoagulation with the mechanical processes and the risk of thromboembolism from mechanical valves as thrombosis in this case is much more common in the mechanical valve in comparison to the bioprosthetic valve. Class 2b to have percutaneous aspiration to produce debulking of right intraatrial septic mass. It may be considered in selected patients who are at high risk for open heart surgery. So if there is a surgical experience with this procedure, it can be performed as an alternative to surgery. And don't forget that some patients may need to have epicardial pacing at the time of tricuspid valve surgery in case of presence of pre or intraoperative AV block because it is not wise to replace the valve and then put a transvenous lead pacemaker after it because it increases the risk of infection. So we are going to put an epicardial pacing lead during the surgery. And reminding ourselves with the indications of immediate epicardial pacemaker implantation during valve surgery in those having preoperative conduction abnormality, staph aureus infection, aortic root abscess or tricuspid valve involvement due to their close proximity to the AV nodes or previous valvular surgery, put an epicardial pacemaker by the surgeon, don't wait to have transvenous pacemaker implantation. Then we are going to speak about non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. From its name, it is a non-infectious pathology, which is a rare condition, usually occurring in some patients with a predisposing factors and or hypercoagulable state. For example, those with systemic lupus or antiphospholipid syndrome, usually called Lempensac endocarditis, those with cancers that we call Marantic endocarditis, Patients with DIC, 
tuberculosis or some autoimmune disease, they are liable to this type of inflammation which is non-infectious and caused by hypercoagulability. In a recent registry, 41% of those patients had cancer, so it was the most common cause. And the three most frequent cancers were lung adenocarcinoma, breast cancer, and pancreatic cancer. 36% having primary antiphospholipid syndrome and 33 having systemic lupus and 21 having both systemic lupus and secondary antiphospholipid syndrome. How are we going to diagnose it? Those patients are non-infectious. So the clinical presentation is usually by embolic complication like stroke, which is the most frequent clinical presentation in 60% of cases and heart failure was observed in just 21%. So it should be suspected in patient presenting with systemic embolization plus a predisposing factor like cancer, antiphospholipid, or systemic lupus. But the patient is not usually presenting with fever, rigors, or malaise like the classic types of infective endocarditis. The first line of investigation to ask for is the transthoracic echocardiography, which confirms the diagnosis in 45% of patients, with the mitral valve being more affected than the aortic valve. Limp and sac endocarditis has a characteristic appearance for its vegetation, which are usually located near the leaflet's edge of coaptation, which is the highest site of friction and frequently extending to the basal and mid portion of the leaflet, rarely to be associated with valve dysfunction or perforation, which is an important way to differentiate it from bacterial infective endocarditis, which are common to show valvular stenosis, regurgitation, or perforation. So the echo may be helpful here to differentiate vegetation of non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis from infective endocarditis, Lambel's excrescence, fibroblastoma, or other benign tumors. And of course, transesophageal echo here is essential due to its higher sensitivity, specificity, and negative predictive values and transesophageal echocardiography to both are required. Then we are going to check the lab findings of a hypercoagulable state like measuring lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies, D-dimer and fibrin degradation products. They may be present in this disease, but they are not specific as they may be shown in other infective endocarditis patients with embolic events. Then how are we going to treat this disease? Treatment of the underlying disease is the cornerstone, like treating lupus or cancer, to prevent recurrent non-bacteria thrombotic endocarditis. Anticoagulant treatment, either by unfractionated heparin, BKA, or low molecular weight heparin, is essential in all patients to prevent thrombosis, which is the main pathology in this disease. And remember, in infective endocarditis, anticoagulation was not an indication except in presence of pre-existing indication like prosthetic valve or AF. Otherwise, no role for anticoagulation. But here, anticoagulation is a cornerstone of treatment and no role for antibiotics except in case of secondary infection. Of course, no data to support the use of non vitamin K oral anticoagulant in non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis and of course in antiphospholipid syndrome NOACs may be associated with a higher risk of thrombotic events in comparison to warfarin so always in antiphospholipid syndrome and all types of non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis use warfarin as an oral anticoagulation not NOAC. Surgery has a debatable rule but it may be considered in rare cases in which there is severe valve dysfunction or large vegetations, otherwise treatment of the cause and anticoagulant. So we have reached the end of our video today and our take home message that all will think of the predisposing condition to suspect and diagnose right-sided infective endocarditis in case of presence of IV drug use or immunocompromised state or presence of an indwelling venous catheter and the non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis as in case of presence of lupus, cancer or antiphospholipid syndrome. So the key to diagnose is the presence of a predisposing condition and then according to the clinical picture you can reach the diagnosis of this disease. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait for another video about another specific type of infective endocarditis.